everyone and welcome to another session of Quad Talks, where we bring you together to engage, interact, and ins be inspired. It's fantastic to see everyone here this morning on Palm Sunday. Um, these talks to you are presented to you by KIS and Cody Friends International, which is an independent nonprofit organization in the United States that supports the educational mission of Cody Canal International School in India and its alumni. This book talk is Murder He Wrote with our special guest, writer Alan Johnson, class of 1979. And sitting opposite him is Athmiha Saravanan, class of 2022. Alan is a two-time Fulbright scholar currently working as English professor at the University of Idaho. When I first met Alan, it was at Camp Kirkenwald, and it was clear from the minute go that he had an avid interest in Indian culture and languages, and that was inculcated in him since childhood. Alan has also published works of nonfiction, including Out of Bounds, the Anglo-Indian Literature and the Geography of Displacement in 2011. He also has a variety of articles uh, on topics ranging from environment literature in India, Hindi film, and to teaching Amitabh Ghosh. But tonight we gather to talk about his debut fic fiction book called Family Plot. And to ask him all about it, we have here our current student and keen writer, designer, Atmiha. This young Kennedy woman has been with us since grade six and is passionate about everything she does. You can always count on her to apply herself 100% and more, whether it's dancing with her dorm girls on stage, singing in the choir, or debating in the halls of the quad. She has her eyes set on the creative field of designing as her future career, and it is a great pleasure to have you here, Akmiha, and we look forward to this conversation you have planned with Alan. Over to you. Hi everyone, and thank you so much. And and special thank you, Mr. Allen, for giving this opportunity to invite uh, to interview you. And I have to say that I've read the book and I really enjoyed it. The Family Plot was the first murder mystery book I have read, and it has taken me on this spectacular journey. Where there were times I had to hold my breath as I was flipping through the pages. And I and I know that there are a few people out there who haven't read the book or who, who are still reading the book. So I'm just going to share my experience and summarize the book as I go along without spoiling it. So set in the southern part of India, the character and the plot are weaved together in a way that draws the reader into the book. The subtle hints of local characteristics, along with the well-put-together plot, made the book all the more interesting for me. The Tamil nuances and the vivid description of Kodi school itself had me smiling at so many times. Mr. Allen has incorporated various culture within his book and has given us a vivid description about each character that personally made it easy for me to connect with. And as, as you all know, India itself is a very culturally diverse place. And the book being set in a small hill station with a strong British colonial past, it is definitely easy for the reader to connect to the multicultural and the multi-ethnicity that is going on in the book. And I would say that the family plot has the perfect balance of mystery, thriller, and love for romantics like myself. As a reader, the last thing anyone would expect from a charming little town in southern India would be murder. Slow but the steady character development and the danger of murder just looming in the background provides a satisfaction of solving crimes as the books develop. Then the novel is half told before the death of Anna Peters and the other half after the death of Anna Peters, so it's perfectly builds up the adrenaline and thrill you need to finish the book. And the book starts off with, with blue skies and green grasses carefully aligned near the lake water and the, and the usual buzz of an Indian town. But then later, the plot builds up to the murder of a former teacher, Miss Anna Peters, that immediately brings the chills to the citizens of, ta of the town, Munanai. The investigation brings in the new doctor in town, Dr. Ravi Krishnaswamy, and the sub-inspector, Muthu Satyamurti. Anna's former friend, and also who is also a student, who was in town to visit her, Jiffy. Jiffy Lyal, he gets dragged into this mess and gets arrested by the sub-inspector when a book gifted to him is found in a home after her murder. While Dr. Ravi and Anna Peters' friend from the poetry club dwell over, over a lost soul, the retired Colonel Mukherjee is found shot dead. Between the days of ancient skull discovery and the new property development issues that destroy the charm of the local town, the book explores a link between Jiffy's book and the murderers. 
with a life threatening death with a life threatening death threats and a past that is impossible to run away from dr ravi knows that one thing is clear the lal family plot of land is is tied to the mystery and what the reader gets with this novel is an in-depth exploration of all the aspects of uh, of the suspects and as well as an exploration of the 1980s india itself and ultimately reading this book has been an unforgettable mem- uh, journey and memory for me because i wouldn't i would have missed out on this interesting genre if it wasn't for your book so so thank you mr allen for writing this book in the first place and yeah. now i thought yeah and and now i thought i could just go on into the questions that i i have a few questions that i like to ask so firstly i have to say that being a tamilian myself i've grown up watching a, a lot of tamil movies and what's astounding is that the plot unravels very similarly and with the with a very clearly defined characters um, su- such as villains and protagonists uh, i found it very similar to a tamil movie so i just wanted to know do you watch a lot of kollywood movies and could you just share a few words about this please yeah thanks and by the way that's an amazing introduction thank you um uh, i wonder if i could borrow that for my <laughs> <laughs> um that's really great thank you so much atmia um and thank you to manjusha and silvia for organizing all the this talk as well as all the quad talks this is a great uh, series uh yeah I, to answer your question i grew up watching hindi films in pune and amdavad uh in about this was in the uh, era of silent films um no i'm just kidding uh this was a long time ago and uh i um you know grew up with those some of those old classic hindi movies and i hadn't thought of the novel as an unraveling in that way but i do think as a in in my teaching of literature uh, there is a lot of correspondence between the way a uh, film uh, is plotted and and uh, narr- uh literature is plotted narratives other kinds of narratives and so it may be subconscious maybe but uh yeah i hadn't thought of that and um i didn't know unfortunately i didn't i wish i had watched more tamil films um uh i've watched f- some others from different parts of northern india mostly but um yeah. i think there's a lot of similarity there so uh sure uh yeah some of that influenced me to some degree yeah Yeah and yeah I mean it's really great because I really enjoy it as well it was like it was the treat like for me it was like watching a movie and great. it was really nice so That's good <laughs> to know I wanted yeah <laughs> and I wanted to know um what drew you to write a murder mystery novel um in the first place because this is your first novel and I wanted to know why this genre specifically well, That's a great question so I'd always wanted to write uh I didn't know that I'd end up writing not you know academic uh thing you know uh, works or research before fiction but um you know i would dabble in in writing and so forth and um mostly the time it didn't you know but with so much time devoted to research and other things in life i sort of kept putting it off but finally i thought just a few years ago i'd say about 7 oh, 8 years ago i said you know it's now or never and um uh and so i before that i think i had you know not thought of a mystery novel genre specifically um be, but i ended up i enjoy reading mysteries and i thought it would be a great way to um bring in lots of colorful characters uh and things like that so that's what i decided uh, i just wanted to have fun with it because um i would write on the uh weekends and parts of the summers and and things like that. So, um in writing uh in choosing this genre I ha- I did read up about which I love reading as a, you know, just as a fan, but the actual mechanics of writing this uh needed some some uh work. So I looked at I read a lot about how to plot these things. So I uh, I had to spend a lot of time plotting it, but of course the plot changes as you write. So Uh the other thing the reason that I think the mystery novel genre may look somewhat like film is because it does have or somewhat like popular film is it does have a definable uh plot right there's a there's a there's certain pacing and and plot mechanisms that red herrings you know you you put something in and then a false lead and so forth these are pretty you know fairly common in a lot of popular um films 
and which I grew up with, as you said. So, um, so those were some of the reasons. Um, I also, though, d did want to try to make it somewhat literary, uh, as far as I can. I'm not saying I succeeded, but <laughs> I, uh, I did want to bring in uh, lots of, um, you know, historical context, uh, cultural context, those sorts of things. Um, so I think I would have done that with any any genre. Yeah, and I, I'd say you definitely brought in all of those because as a reader, I could, I mean, living in Kodi now, I could definitely see all the historical context you brought in. And, and I love the descriptions, you know, the this, this small, tiny details in the books. I think it was my okay. favorite part of your book because I really enjoyed them. So I definitely say you did a very good job in that. Thank you. That's, that's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was just and I was just thinking maybe you could just read a short passage now to, to just give a little gist to the audience. Yeah, so we have what is it two hours here? Uh, so for me to read. Uh, no, I'll just read, <laughs> I'll just read for one minute and uh, um, because it's it's you know it's hard for me to know where, where to what to read. So I'll just read from the beginning of the book and just um, a few paragraphs, and then we can see what how that feels. So chapter one is, uh, it tells you the setting because, you know, uh, Palani Hills, Southern India, 1985, we can talk more about why. And it's, uh, so I'll just start reading. Moments before she died, Anna Peters, also known as Madam, sat facing the lake on her back veranda and mistook the noise, faint click, light shuffle of feet, for her cook entering by the front door. Mary, she called in her usual sing-song. I'm in the back, Mary. You're quick today. Did you find the guavas? Were they ripe? I do hope they're ripe. I hope you did smell them. They must be soft, soft. She paused for a reply. With her handkerchief, she wiped the saliva that liked to leak out her mouth and onto her frock. Bhavani had pointed this out to her a few months ago. You're spotting your top, she'd said, as if anyone cared how an old woman looked. Nonetheless, for her friend's sake, Anna had begun tucking a hanky under the neckline. Bhavani now complained that this presented an unseemly lump. Just like me, Anna had snapped, and Bhavani knew the subject was closed. It was a perfect June morning in the hill station with cumulus clouds and bright sun. By afternoon, it would rain. Already, Anna could feel the air dampening. Without the rain, she would have felt lost, her day torn from its habit. She shifted her wide buttocks on her cane chair. She hoped Jiffy would make one more visit before he left. It was so nice to see him again, his handsome face, the pleasing blend of Indian and English blood, blood. She'd nearly told him the truth yesterday. She could no longer guard secrets he had a right to know. It would be a relief to them both, surely. But to say it to him, she would write to him instead. Yes, she would do that. The way she had, she had in the book. It might even be better, less abruptly told. She had no talent for softness. And what would have been the result of spoken words? He might have cried like a boy the way he did after one of the scoldings by her or another teacher, when despite the clenched jaw and defiant frown, drops used to squeeze through his eyes. I'm going to skip down a little bit, a few paragraphs because of the time. And um, she's watching a boat on the, the lake. Um, and so I'll uh, start there. On the smooth surface of the lake, 30 meters or, or so out, she saw a tourist couple struggling with the oars of a rented rowboat. This never failed to amuse her. The city wallahs never wanted to admit that a mere boat could prove so unruly. Wiser visitors hired a rower. The man, who even from a distance Anna could see was thin and wore large sunglasses, had dropped an oar into the lake and was leaning dangerously low over the water to retrieve it. The woman appeared to be laughing nervously. A chirping sound drifted across the water. Anna prayed for a splash, then quickly and half-heartedly asked God's indulgence for such a thought. The boat rolled, the man tottered, Anna leaned forward in her wicker chair, the woman seemed to be saying something excitedly to the man and pointing at her, at her, Anna. But she wasn't pointing, she was holding something. Ah, a camera. One of those big ones the tourists love. The woman held the cam camera to her eye to click. Is she taking my photo? 
The man had regained his balance and was shouting now. Why shout in such stillness, for heaven's sake? You can't understand a word anyway, and if you fall, you fall. He began waving a hand at the camera when trying to communicate something, but surely. Mercifully, the blow to the base of Anna's skull was precise and effective, crushing the bone into shards and preventing her brain from registering the image on her retinas of a man yowling in pain, pitched overboard. What she might have seen a second later in the peripheral field of her bad left eye as she fell to the stone veranda was a figure, no more than a stab of red, arching towards her as if, she, as if trying to catch her. But the image faded rapidly into blackness along with the sound, a harsh whisper of what might have been her name. One more paragraph here. Some 40 minutes afterwards, when, Anna found, when Mary found her lying on her side, the faded blue frock splayed like a curtsy. It was the quiet of the scene. The still and boatless lake, the soft glint of blood congealing on the veranda, that more than anything else made the cook doubt her own eyes and shake Mem Saeed's arm and say over and over, Amma, Amma. And it was a book on hill tribes with Jiffy Lyle's name signed in it, resting on the table beside Anna's veranda chair that brought the police to him two days later with questions he could not or would not answer. Even before the truth came out, even as Jiffy sat in a jail cell and the old skull had everyone talking, it was clear that the town would never be the same. A little long, but sorry. <laughs> no, no, that was, I know it was perfect. And it was really nice because I think it's, oh, it's, a, it's really nice sometimes hear the book the story from the author's voice, from the author's perspective, and it's really nice. Thank you so much for doing Good. that. Great. Thanks. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, so the next question I have is: What was one of the most in, uh, the most surprising things you learned in the process of creating your book? Oh wow! Yeah, I learned so many things. Um, well, I learned that writing, and I'm sure this has been said. I know I was listening to Ruvani talk a couple months ago, and uh, writing is. Uh, and as some of you know, it, I started out with this idealistic idea, which I held on for years, that I would be inspired, you know, and write this great literature. But writing is, like anything else, it, it has to be a kind of a job. It has to be a discipline. So sometimes what you write is going to be not very good. But you try to, uh, some people aim for a certain number of words a day. Some people aim for a um, uh, certain time frame. Uh, in my case, I always wanted to just write something, uh, and uh, so that was one thing. So I learned that discipline and, and working on, uh, on that aspect was important. Also, I think just uh, as I mentioned, plotting it out, I took a big poster paper and plotted out the, 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 the uh, different characters and the plots so that I could draw lines between them and see how they connected because it becomes quite complicated, and I may have on, as this my first uh, fiction, uh, mis first mystery, I may have had quite a few <laughs> uh, uh, plot lines. But in any case, it was a lot of fun. And so that was another thing I learned. Um, I learned a lot about the air, uh, more things about Kore that I just hadn't known, um, you know, about the, the rock from it, the geology, um, uh, the natural fauna and flora, things that you you sort of know you may have picked up some of that there but um uh, i learned about that so um yeah i just i think it gave me a more a greater respect for the the area and uh for the richness of culture in just in the Polony hills so. and i just wanted to ask um did you uh and like, uh, what was the challenge? Like, did you face any obstacles? Did you experience any writer's block while doing so? Because I know that's one of the biggest challenges for all writers. So did you face any of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, it's mostly, yeah, writer's block is there. And as I said, even if I just type something, I would just wanted to do it. And I'd find the next day that I think differently and, and have something to say, but also, I think, uh, you know, you write something and it looks really, really terrible, right? And it may be, but, <laughs> but then you have to come back the next day and you may see it in a different light, right? So um, that was an obstacle. I think just, it just 
took a lot of time and I think uh, you have to keep, you know, the goal in sight uh, and um, you don't know how long it's going to be. As it turns out, um, what I didn't know when I started writing is that genre, they call this genre fiction, right? And I think that's a misnomer, but by that they mean in the trade um, books that are uh, fairly short uh, and they have kind of for debut authors, especially you, you have to fit a certain niche because otherwise they're not going to look at it. So I, the book was twice as long to begin with. And it was a good thing I cut, I had to cut it <laughs> because uh, there was a lot of baggage. I had other characters and things. Um, so I had to narrow it down. Even this apparently is a bit longish for a first book. That, so it had trouble getting um, a couple of publishers were interested, but it was a bit long for them. So I had to learn to uh, be concise. Also, the other thing I think in writing is I had to learn not uh, just, just to be uh, fairly um, hard nosed. That is, you know, I had to be uh, strict about eliminating scenes that I liked, but that didn't fit. So, you know, you just have to just be ruthless and it's hard on, for your own writing, but then you realize you know, there's, you can always use that material some other time perhaps, and it's all part of the process. Um, those were some of the things. Yeah, I, I have some, I could say more, but. I... Mm -hmm, yeah. And, and I just want to say that um, I think, I think what makes your book very special is that there's so many characters and so many different plot lines, but in the end, it's just the way it all comes together. And as a reader, you get to explore each and every aspect of those plot lines. And I think that's what makes it so special for as a reader to me as well. So I think I, I really enjoyed that aspect. Oh, great. As well. I'm glad it, I'm glad it, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to hear. Especially, yeah, from, from you as especially a good reader and, and, you, you're a big avid reader, but first time you'd read a mystery. So it's good to hear that. Yeah, and this is my, I, I mentioned before, as my first mystery, the murder mystery novel, and I really enjoyed it, so. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to know what was, um, and I want to know what was like for you growing up in Cody back at your time, and were any of the characters and the settings inspired by your, your time in Cody? <laughs> Yes, I've had a lot of people say, oh, is that so-and-so? And, -so? and uh, yes, uh, some of them are, but they're usually composites. <laughs> so <laughs> some will know from way back, uh, for me anyway, uh, Madame, Madame was a, a woman who taught uh, French. So she was kind of a, uh, one of the color interesting characters. We had, Of course, we had so many amazing teachers and also people coming through, drifting through Cody, um, meeting authors and, um, you know, musicians and um, still that, that happens. And so um, it, I think just the, um, some of, many of the characters were, were based on that, but sometimes they would be a com combination, a composite of different characters. So some will, when I, when people say, oh, is that so-and-so, I hesitate to always say it because, uh, <laughs> Unless they're dead, then that's easy. Um, but um, but when you know, uh, it's usually with the fondness anyway. Uh, it's never. It's always with a fond recollection. Um, some of the characters, however, might be based on my my childhood and uh, an upbringing in Pune and Ahmedabad. Also, maybe uh, staying in uh, up in North India quite a bit, Kanpur and other areas. Um, so that you meet interesting people, you know, and, and you want to put them in your, in your novel. Uh, so those are, yeah, I, I would say there are a number of characters. Uh, as far as the school, and I may have mentioned this, bef maybe it was before we were uh, started uh, in the actual Zoom conversation, but the, um, the, uh, the way in which, um, you know, you can, Cody is as a hill station, it has that, as we said, as I was saying, that ethos of the, um, the British started it. Now it became more Americanized, I realized. But if you go to Shimla, and I've been to a number of other hill stations in the North, um, you get a, the, and Masudi and so forth, you do get a sense of that, uh, it's, it's a unique place. And it's a place where there's, it's a crossroads of many, many different 
cultures all over India, and also some from uh, Europe uh, outside of India. So Anna Anna Peters in this novel is a uh, originally from uh, Europe, right? Which is based mm -hmm. partly on uh, on characters we had uh, in Cody, but also uh, people would come. And one the other thing I wanted to show was um, I I didn't want I was and very painfully conscious of literature that is exoticizes places. For us, we're all we you know we think of India and Cody as home, but um, there's still a you um, you know you see a lot of books written about you know set in places that where people aren't as familiar they're not as familiar with the culture and so but one of the things I wanted to show was the cross cultural uh, aspects uh, even from India so the the Ravi the doctor comes from um, North India right. Uh, and so he is, and he was in Bhopal. That's just a one, one or two pages. Um, he experienced the Bhopal thing. I don't go. I don't want to push that too much. And then he comes to uh, to Tamil Nadu, and he doesn't know the language or the culture. And that happens quite a, quite often, right? Now it, it's it's said in 1985, uh, partly because. I wanted to. I wanted to be able to be more accurate and authentic with what my memories are of mm -hmm. that region. Even though I visited Cody, you know, several times before, as I mentioned, I was there for a few months in 2017. But um, I thought, well, I'll, I wanted to set it there for a number of other reasons too. I think you still had this. Anna Peters would have been a figure who was still there in India, right? Older, quite old, elderly. But um, you know, people who had be come before independence. Uh, I even mentioned these facts like Maria Montessori being in Cody, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, things like that, which um, a lot of you know people don't know. And I'm always shocked. And you might have more to say about this, Atmiha, but I'm always still stunned how um, little people in northern India know about southern India. You know. And so yeah, I wanted, I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think, yeah, I was, I was just going to ask you, so, because there's always a big cultural difference, even, even though it's a big, it's a, it's a one country, there's, there's so many cultures, so many ethnicities. So, I mean, I, I, I understand why, you know, there's a, there's a segregation between the North and the South. It's very vivid as well. So, uh, how come, like, because um, I noticed that you mentioned the, this tribal community called Todas, and I, I'm, I did some research, and I know that they have very strong association with the Nilgiris, but not specifically Kodi. And I right. know it's, your book's based off of memories from Kodi. So, how come you chose this community in specific, and why this tribal community? Well, oh, that's an excellent question, and it, it was a calculated move on my part. Um, I wanted to bring in. I had had a much more extensive backstory to the Todas. Um, in the original draft, and I, but I'd wanted to bring in the another sort of dimension of the hills that you don't normally see, and I knew very well that uh, the Nilgiris are where, where you mostly find them. But on the other hand, there were a few Dodas who had come to uh, Kodekanao um, because they migrated, right? They're looking for work in the yeah. 1970s and 80s, uh, just as, for example, I even thought about writing about the Sri Lankan Tamil migrants, but I didn't know enough. Uh, I would have to do more research because when I was back there now, I see that they're kind of in their, many of them are in their own communities. And so um, that kind of thing. Uh, so I just was, I've, I've always been fascinated by that, uh, you know, the, the Torahs and, and others and tribals in the North as well, partly through my research in academ academic research, uh, tribal uh, literature. But um, I hadn't, uh, yeah, it, it was, a, it was a, again, maybe a, a risk uh, that I took. That's why I took some poetic license, as you notice. So the town, for those of you who haven't read it, it's, it's, it's Munanai, but it's, so I want, didn't want it to make it exactly Korekanao. Uh, I wanted it to be like a little bit of Uti, a little bit of this and that. Just because, hey, you know, you, you get to play God when you're writing. So, uh, <laughs> Um, you just have fun with the different characters, yeah. And I, I, was, I was just wondering, do you know anyone personally from the community? Like, have you ever met someone? 
from the Judas community? Uh, no, the only time, to be honest, that's a great question. The only time was when uh, uh, we were in school. I can't remember if this was like middle school or what. Uh, there was a, they hired some uh, to to help with the tree clearing after a storm. Uh, and again, this was for, purely for employment, uh, and I don't know how they got there. The other thing they did, did was, uh, so a distinct memory, and I think it's in the novel, uh, is um, a kind of a grim memory. So most of these are happy, and there is humor in the novel. But um, uh, the grim memory is I was uh, once when I was about 13, 14 at the golf course, there was a big commotion. And remember this place they used to call uh, Suicide Point, I think it's called Green Valley View. Yeah, yeah, it's called. <laughs> I'm glad they changed the name. Uh, but I did see a suicide being brought up, uh, a young woman who didn't fail their exams and so forth. So they had to hire uh, tribals. Um, now, I don't know, I think it was a mix of Torres and others, I was told, uh, to bring the body up and wrapped in, uh, it was very, very steep terrain. So that was the only way. Uh, and it was wrapped in um, uh, like natural grasses, uh, almost like you would wrap a mummy. Uh, and that's how they dragged, four men had to drag it up an extremely steep area. Those are the only times I remember. Okay, okay, yeah. And having lived most of your childhood in Kodi while your parents were in the North, I just wondering, did you ever find it, find yourself defending the South Indians or taking up their side of an argument? Because I know we just spoke about like the big segregation between the North and the South. So, and you spent a lot of time in the South. So did that have a major influence on you as an individual itself? Yes, yes, it did. Uh, actually, it's funny, I, I, it wasn't, I didn't really think about it as a, as a kid, you know, growing up, but it's more recently actually where you go up to um, uh, the north uh, when I go to conferences or you know I've been at like dozens of dozens of universities and so forth um, and you find people in the north again this ignorance is stunning but they'll say well uh, you know they'll matter of fact is you know well Sanskrit was the the language of everyone right period and then I'll point out that Tamil was is just as ancient and has just as rich a uh, tradition. So those kinds of things uh, is where I start sort of defended. Those have been more in academic settings um, where I defend Tamil uh, in that way. And of course, you can see the in Hindi films, you can see some of the uh, stereotypes still. I think it's getting a lot better, but uh, um, you still see some stereotypes about the South. So. Yeah, if I were to, if I write about it or talk about it, that's when I'll sort of try to uh, uh, bring that up. Now, it, it should, I, I mentioned Pune has a little small role in there. Uh, that's because um, having been born there in first years, it was also a crossroads. I think my sisters might have more, no more, but it was a crossroads of, uh, of India even back then, right? Before there was more mobility, just because it was a military place, it was also a hill sta uh, considered a hill station. It's, it's not really, but it's higher elevation, good climate. Uh, and so you'd get people kind of like Bangalore. So you'd get people from all over. Uh, and I, we had a lot of Tamilian friends and uh, so forth. Yeah, I, I understand that. And, um, and I wanted to know when did you last visit Kodi? Because um, and and I wanted to know how and your stands on the increased population and the buildings in Kodi because there were so many references in your book and and the pro and you mentioned a lot of like problems such as land use, pollution, urbanization in your book. And I was just wondering if they were inspired by your recent visits or did you just hear them from your friends? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Actually, it was back in the eighties, uh, wasn't it? Uh, someone can correct me, uh, where they had the the one company that uh, there was uh, poison, uh, toxic materials in the soil and so forth. It was one of these, was it Hindu, not Hindustan Lever, but some other big company set up a factory. So already in the 80s, you, you had this problem. And then, of course, uh, I know the school is doing great things with environmental education and so on. So... Uh, that was always, you know, on my mind as I've read more. And certainly when I went in 2017, I, I really um, 
I learned a lot more about um, the deforestation and uh, all those things. And uh, for example, the problems with eucalyptus trees and so on. And um, which by the way is a global problem. Uh, the British introduced eucalyptus trees all over the world from Australia and they've, um, they've been kind of really destructive to nat native habitats, but that's another story. But uh, that's why Anna Peters is, she's opposing the um, development of this hotel. The, she's, um, the, the development of this giant hotel uh, and that I noticed already starting mostly in the 80s. So I think those of us who went in the 70s, we were fortunate, you know, and, and I know a lot of my classmates, I know some of them are on here, um, and other friends uh, from other years will uh, uh, sort of share this experience that <clears throat> we really uh, sad to see the, the pollution in the lake or all the buildings coming up. But then that's, we know that, I mean, on the other hand, that's the way the world seems to operate, right? It tends to <laughs> develop things and um, with tourism going on and you can't, I mean, it is sad to see some of that, but, um, but at least it's, it's heartening to see people work uh, on behalf of the environment. I don't know if I answered your question. No, no, yeah, yeah I, I think you did, yeah. And yeah, and I was, I wanted, and I know we spoke about this before the interview, but just I want others to also hear it. So, so there's a passage in the book that refers to the dolmen, the, the hike, the dolmens. And oh, yeah. I was just wondering, um, did this come from your experience in hiking in school? And did you, like, did you hike a lot in school while you were in Cody? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I did hike. I didn't earn a tar pit, I'm embarrassed to say. And I did a lot, I've done a lot more hiking in, as you know, in later years, but I did, uh, we did go on, uh, of course, the Betagem trip, uh, that's always fun, and uh, places like that, and I remember some of you will ha ha remember uh, the sixth grade teacher we had, John Wiebe, who took us to the Dolmens, and um, that was great experience, uh, and so it just stuck in my brain ever since then, you know, the, how old these these stones were and that they're still here. And, um, and that again, sort of made me think of the sort of uh, ancient uh, inhabitants of, of the hill station. I know they'd, there's still a lot of debate about who these people were. Uh, were they the, the tribals we think of today? Those may have been later arrivals, but it doesn't matter. It's, uh, it just makes, makes you appreciate that, um, you know, people have been here for a long time and uh, and they took time, the trouble to make these uh, put these stones uh, in place. And oh, the other place that figures in the novel is the the Shembagunur, the Jesuit Seminary Museum. We went on a field trip there, and uh, I remember it, it has some kind of shocking exhibits <laughs> for little kids. But um, uh, it was again stayed in my brain. It's just a fascinating place. Uh, uh, just you know, interesting play, uh, things on, on uh, display. And some of those were the uh, artifacts taken from the dolmens, right? Uh, the large clay vessels with the, they use for burial, uh, things like that. So that's why I, I'm not, I always, I have a uh, hobby, uh, lay interest in uh, archeology span and, and so forth. So I put the one character, uh, the Jesuit priest, uh, and of course, I have these religious issues too. Uh, uh, inter the inter the dialogue among uh, you know all these different religions, and uh, so he's uh, he's an archaeologist. So yeah, yeah, and I think I've been to the museum you're talking about, and yeah, it, it definitely does have some very interesting artifacts. So yeah, <laughs> and. Um, and being an English professor at a university, I mean, we, people would imagine that we uh, very easy when it comes to writing and editing. And I want to know, did you struggle with any of that, especially editing your book? Because you already spoke about how your book was twice as long as the one you published right now. So was editing a very big challenge for you? Yes, yes. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic uh, that we teach students. We always say it's hard to be your own self-editor but we are always teaching students to edit and things like that. And, and I have to say that writing an academic 
work is a little, uh, has a different, completely different flow and different kind of uh, uh, idea because you, you're, you have certain points you want to get to, right, and, and do that. But with a, a, a novel is more organic. You can't um, just, um, you know, do it as you would a research uh, work. And so, yeah, writing, it's not easy because as I said, you'll write something uh, in, in a character's voice and it'll look really terrible to you sometimes. And so you have to edit, you have to read, change everything and whittle it down. And even then you're not completely satisfied. So I think it, it's, it's always a challenge. Yeah, there's no, it, it doesn't get easy. I wish it were. But. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and um, with the with the modern day society taking everything very literally, and recently I was actually reading up this article about how Dr. Seuss's book was being deemed as racist because it's very accurate about the cultural descriptions of of his book. And I wanted to know were you worried about any cultural appropriation, as the book held a lot of Tamil nuances, which I really enjoyed, and and the culture that can often be interpreted otherwise, because I think it's one of it's a very um, controversial subject to also talk about. So, yeah, no, that's a great question, and yes, I was very, uh, very sensitive to that. That was one of the things I worried about. You know, if I would come across as appropriating, or again, I mentioned the, that I didn't want to exoticize, but even other things you might do subconsciously, and so um, I, uh, because I teach a, a lot of literature like that. And uh, I, I teach, I talk about cultural appropriation, and it, it's certainly something we have to be very, very um, sensitive to. Um, the so again, I think just so the only thing I can say is that having been born and raised in India, I feel like I had a more insight. The other thing I always have felt is that I've already said this that living, having lived all over India and traveled all over, um, you know, I felt like I could be a kind of a happy medium or mediator uh, for these different cultures. Uh, because there, so on the one hand, there is cultural appropriation. So that that's a key point. On the other hand, um, and I'm sure Pete Schmidt Hunter would say more about this. On the other hand, there's no such thing as a purely authentic uh, culture, right? Uh, we can debate that if you'd like, but um, there is no such thing as uh, as that. Um, so you've got to find a way to, um, on the one hand, be acknowledge and obviously be and inhabit, if you can, that uh, one culture that you're writing about, the culture, the different cultures. On the other hand, you also want to uh, make a stand against any type of fundamentalism of any sort whether it's religious or, um, you know, when I was in uh, Tamil Nadu uh, in, the, was it 2016-17, and some of you know much more about this than I do, but the Jalikattu, the, uh, you know, the bull uh, festival, and that became, it, you could understand why that was a politicized vis-a-vis -vis the North, which the North, those of you who don't know, there's that in, this ancient um, age-old uh, bullfighting, uh, wrestling, uh, festival uh, in and mostly in smaller places in Tamil Nadu. And that became a rallying point for people. I was in the, dem I actually, my car went and got caught in the demonstration. Um, and that was a, a, a politicizing of Tamil uh, heritage against sort of the Hindi belt. And that, that was totally understandable. So that level I understood. On the other hand, as I read and talked to people, Many uh, were rallying for it who didn't hadn't really known much about it beforehand, right? Uh, or didn't hadn't paid attention. So that becomes tricky as to what. Uh, not that I bring all this into the novel, but it is the backdrop to this idea of what. Um, how do we? How do you negotiate those tensions, right? Uh, on the one hand, you do have this national. Uh, that's what's. I mean. Uh, has had so far kept India together is this national um, understanding uh, and cross-cultural understanding. And yet, um, you know, if we gravitate too much to the other direction, that could be a problem. So all of these were in my mind uh, as I wrote this as a, because I'm a professor and whether I succeeded or not, I have no idea, but 
I was trying to be sensitive to all the, um, I think on the level of nuance, right? The, the, the small matters. Uh, just, hey, these are people that are, it's fun when you write because they're human. They're, they're just ordinary people. So I did have to think about the accent, uh, how I would do that. And so the, Ravi and uh, Mutu, Mutu is the, uh, the superintendent police, sub-inspector, sorry. He, um, so he's from Tamil Nadu, uh, but he's been in the North. Ravi doesn't know anything about the South, so they have to speak in English, right? So yet, how do they, you know, I had to think about that, so. But, but on the other hand, Ravi uh, is a, um, a, but he fancies himself a poet and he um, reads mostly a, a lot of English poetry. So. Yeah, and I think personally, I, I've, as I mentioned before, I really enjoy the small Tamil faces. And you, you, you also managed to mention some Tamil songs in the book. And I was actually really surprised because as a reader, I could like, and especially me having a very strong Tamil background, I can literally imagine the song playing in the background. That was, that was, I think that that's what made the experience very special for me as well. So I really enjoyed that. That's great. That's great. Yeah the writer we all share our stories or a part of who we are with the audience and it doesn't exactly have to be a moral but just um, a short message that we want to get across so so what was that one thing that you wanted to share through this book to the audience and the readers oh wow yeah i don't know if i have one thing but uh, i guess just appreciation of uh, all cultures languages um uh, customs um and also uh, that very minor sub theme of, of environmental sen being sensitive to that. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. And I think that it's humans are so tribal that for some reason, I don't know what, but that we always have to work at this. And so I wanted to try to convey that, you know, that some character, there are characters in the novel who are really good about that and others who aren't. Uh, Ravi is learning about that, you know. Uh, there's misunderstandings, but they're still working at it. And Mutu and Ravi, yeah, they have this tension. So <laughs> so I think that's the main thing, yeah. Yeah, and I'd, I'd, I'd definitely say it came across because I could, I mean, I understand but, it while, as I was reading the book, so. Oh, that's great. And, that's good. Yeah, and this is the last question I have from me. Um, so, so I wanted to know what are you writing next? Can we expect a sequel to this series, to uh, this book? Yes, uh, yeah. That thank you. Uh, I do intend to write that, and I have the, uh, sketched out the plot and have started writing. But the problem is, I'm trying to finish another book, <laughs> uh, which is not uh, exactly a page turner. It's an academic book, uh, um, and uh, I need to finish that uh, in the next couple of months and then um, for a publisher. And then I can uh, go back to this, which I'm eager, really eager to do. That's my, that's really what I wanna do is write fiction now, so. Yeah, and I'm definitely looking forward to your next book because I, I had such an amazing um, experience reading this one and I can't, and I personally can't wait for the next book. So thank you so much. Well, and thank you so much for making the time. And I just wanna thank everybody as well. Cool. Thanks everyone so much. Who's here today. Uh, yeah, great questions and uh, thanks so much for Thank reading you. it and uh, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So we move into our Q and A session, and uh, I'll start with some of the questions that were in the chat. Um, John Scudder asks if any if it was set in early or late 1985. Just wondering if it would have been before or after he left. He's class 85. Oh. Oh, hi, yes. Uh, class of 85, great. Um, it's mostly, um, it's about the middle of 85. So summer, uh, as we would say, summer of 85. So probably just, bef it could have happened just After around that time, around the time you were graduating. So, yeah. So thanks for that. <laughs> Uh, someone else asked if you're doing, uh, I think it was Peter, uh, who asked if you're doing an audiobook. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yes, I have <laughs> thought of that. I, uh, and there, that's become a lot more common these days. Um, and so, yeah, I do hope to do it um, soon. Uh, 
just haven't given it the time, but um, I'd really like to. And, and I think, yeah, that could reach a lot more people, uh, the audio, because I know that's um, very popular and uh, it's fun to read the read from it. So uh, I don't know that I would hire anyone, but um, maybe. <laughs> Leslie Servit, class of 64, asks, uh, who are your favorite mystery authors? Any of them influential in your writing? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, there, there are lots. And I, I know some, some folks here have read a lot more. Uh, of course, in Cody, uh, just as a kid, reading uh, Agatha Christie, just because those were in the house, um, and things like that. Um, also, more recent years, Tana French, uh, uh, who's a great uh, writer based in Ireland. Um, there's also uh, very different writers, you know. Uh, there's the uh, Scottish writer, uh, my mind's a blank. He writes about Edinburgh. Um, and so different, char different uh, I like uh, writers who uh, write from different uh, cultures and experiences. Um, so let's see, Tana French, um, and um, yeah, there, there are lots of them. The even even fast-paced, uh, I've only read one uh, novel by a very sort of trendy writer named Harlan Coben, I think that's his name. Um, and uh, he's, very, he's very ingenious with plots. So some writers are really good with the plots. Some, like Tana French, want to develop that psychological aspect of the characters. She's more, a little more literary. Some want to give you a, a sort of noirish, you know, like film noir or a hard-boiled detective kind of feel. And uh, yeah, I don't think I listed enough names there, but uh, <laughs> there are a lot of good ones. A lot of good ones. Your next question is from Mary Lowry. And she asked, do you ever get to teach upper level courses in international literature? Where in Idaho are you located? Uh, yeah, good, thank you. Uh, I'm in Southeastern Idaho, uh, roughly two hour drive directly north of, from Salt Lake City. So uh, it's in uh, the town of Pocatello, which is on the way, if anyone's coming, on the way to Yellowstone. Uh, oh, there's another good mystery novel, Long Longmire series set in Wyoming and on the border of Yellowstone Park. Uh, so we're in that region. Uh, yes, I do. I teach uh, all the way. Yeah, we teach the whole, all my colleagues and I teach the range from first year to the doctoral level. And what I'm doing, I'm teaching several uh, different novels in, the, in a seminar now, like um, the Association of Small Bombs, um, or, uh, of course, uh, Arundhati Roy's latest, uh, which is an interesting novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Um, also, I have done some research, just a little bit. I'm not uh, an expert on uh, translations. So translations have really taken off in India, uh, both between regional languages and also into English and so on. So there's a lot of uh, great fiction coming out in that regard. As far as international, the mostly it'd be classics. Um, if you're talking about European, it'd be like Dostoevsky or, or something. Um, as far as modern stuff, I think it'd be more Indian novels, mostly in English. Yeah. Um, another question from Fasal Chaudhry, class of 98. Do you have a moment when after writing several pages, you feel like deleting all you have written? <laughs> spending hours that that will be hard to get back yes uh and as i get older i feel like my brain has been deleting my memory but the um yeah i think definitely i do feel like i'll re write pages and i'll think wow this is great you know because i probably hadn't had any sleep and i'm drinking coffee um and then the next day you read it and it's terrible you know so uh it looks terrible. It's, so you need you need someone else really to read it. And um, uh, yeah, so definitely I do delete things. Or I guess the better thing is just to put it aside. And if you don't use it in this text, you can maybe come back to it. Because even if it's not, even if you don't like the writing, you may have a kernel of an idea there. 
So I put that in a different file. Yeah, so I've got a lot of those files. <laughs> I have a, a question from myself. The, the name of the place, Munanai, um, what inspired the name? And of course, does it refer to a British colonial past or, because it's a very, um, I want you to tell our listeners today what it means as well, so that they can understand your thinking behind it. Well, um, the extent of my Tamil, I mean, I knew some phrases, oh, I see Rafiq is here, he can corroborate this or deny them. I, uh, I knew just a very few, I, as I said, I'm embarrassed I didn't learn more Tamil. But I did learn how to count to 10 and you know, say certain things, um, also some unmentionables. But the, the thing with the, so, so, so I just did the, the, the three, so I, you know how Perumal ha, you know, has that distinctive look. And so I want, this was a fictionalized version. So I wanted to give the name, have the name of the town, uh, res, uh, have some backstory that it was taken because of a physical feature. And so I wanted to, it looked like three dogs. So Moon and I, that's all, that's the only reason, you know. Uh, and I tried to build up more of a backstory. And then the, the, I had this section where the British guidebook had it wrong, you know, that they had said it was four, but the copy editors in the, and my publishers didn't get that quite right in the first edition. But in any case, uh, it was sort of this idea which maybe should have been thought out more, but it was just to give a, a different name to, the, to this town that I could then have fun with uh, fictionalizing, you know. Deb Althaus Dubendorf asks, uh, yes. how long did you have the idea for the novel before you actually wrote it? Oh, good question. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't have the plot or anything. I, what I did have was, I had written this, uh, the first opening part, I, just a certain, very completely different version, but I had this basic character of this woman and the scene in my brain. And that I had written many, many years ago, you know, like 20 plus, and then I'd, for, you know, set it aside, and I thought I'd write a short story, and I never did. And, um, but it did, it stayed with me. So when I thought of writing the mystery novel, maybe eight years ago or so, starting to think about it, I, that scene came back and I thought, hey, that'd be good for a, you know, I, then I developed it, that scene with, so I had this image of this woman, an older woman who was European, kind of with a vague past, uh, who has been in Cordae for a long time or a place like Cody and then uh, is killed. And so I just, sort of developed it from there. So the novel, the actual, this particular, I mean, the way it, it is now was really started in maybe eight years ago, but I had the opening scene from a long time ago. Peter schmitz asked, um, how did you go about finding a publisher? Oh yeah, that's the hardest thing. Um, I know I, I learned some things from Ruvani's talk a couple of months ago and she had been publishing short stories which was a great way thing to do um the um i just didn't i hadn't pursued it enough you know writing making sure i had a track record in, in uh, fiction so uh i um when I, I i did send it out you know queries to uk and american publishers and i got actually some of them were nice enough to reply the these folks um that they they, you know, seemed, sounded great, but they didn't have, they didn't have space for that kind of thing and so on. And I realized later you really need, uh, you, I was trying to avoid getting an agent, but then I realized you had to. So I've been to several literary conferences in India. And um, so at one of them, I met a writer, an author based in Pune, and then she put me in touch with her agent. And I, I met a number of Indian writers, uh, you know, really great writers, but, um, I only asked, uh, she was a, happened to be a fit, uh, mystery writer. So I thought I would ask her and she put me in touch with her agent in, in Delhi. Now agents have only been around in India, professional agents like that about 15 years. So um, it's still developing. And so he chopped it around. And as I said, I think it was it, a couple of presses were in, interested, but they 
like Rupa, but they thought it was too long. So for a first time writer. So then it went to this uh, press in, in Pune, which actually publishes a lot of nonfiction and self-help books and only a little bit of fiction. So it, yeah, it could have been a better press, but uh, we'll see. And I'm trying to, I'm just investigating republishing rights here. Um, but that's, that's a challenge. So, <laughs> so I kind of went about it stumbling through. Uh, I'll, uh, since we're talking about publishing, I'll just jump to Dan Ruparel's question, which says, would you self-publish or use Amazon and the like for your next novel? Great question, Dan. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, everyone, for these great questions. Uh, uh, well, I don't really want to self-publish, uh, but it is an avenue that some people, it, it's very hard to get sort of recognized in that because a lot of people do it. But my book is, of course, available on Amazon. And, um, but that's because the, the, this publisher can have, there's a mechanism that publishers abroad can use Amazon anywhere to, um, they set up a, their own account, but it's still there, it has their imprint on it. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think I'll try to still, my, my ideal would try to be to get a, uh, a publisher in the UK or, or, uh, or, or a good one in India, uh, Harper Collins or something, that's a dream. <laughs> so um, that kind of thing. Uh, so I'd rather go with a, a regular publisher. <clears throat> Meg Green asks, um, what was the scene uh, or detail that you loved most that ended up getting cut? Ah, thanks, Meg. Yeah, there were, uh, there's these two kids, uh, two or three kids from the school, which again is fictionalized. Some people think, oh, that's exactly KIS and you, you know, you got it wrong or something. But again, I just wanted to take liberties, but they are very, they're boarding school kids. And they're, they're out there trying to play, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there is the scene with uh, some of my classmates were recognized with a pellet gun. And uh, uh, so someone uh, shoots the, uh, they're trying, they're not aiming for people, but accidentally shoots a tourist. So uh, that tourist then goes to the, uh, he, he's actually not a tourist, he's, he's a, You'd have to look, read the book, but he's a, a bad guy. And he he goes and gets, uh, tries to get this wound treated at the at the school dispensary. And these, one of the boys is there, uh, accident, you know, coincidentally. And so um, I had more of the backstory of these boys and how they're going to try to play cricket. And then they, there's a whole scene where they antagonize this big, huge guy. They don't know where he's, you know, and they actually get back at him uh, because they run off and they, um, uh, you know, throw the cricket ball at him or something. So those kinds of scenes are a lot of fun, but they didn't really add to the, uh, to the story. So I'll try to work them into a future scene. Yeah, good question though. Yeah. Mona, um, woman from class of 83 asks, Will you continue writing mysteries or will you write other genres of fiction? Yeah, another great question. I do want to write, as I, as Athmeha was asking, I do want to write uh, the sequel and maybe some others with these two. Now, because you, you have to build up a backstory of these characters. They have to be real. You, 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 you have to build up a whole biography of them that you're not going to mention in the book, but it gives them credibility as you write. So I want to I took so much time with that, that years to develop. So I want to uh, continue with them if it's successful. Uh, but I do, uh, yeah, I have ambitions, dreams of, I'm sure like many writers uh, of, or aspiring writers of writing something uh, totally different, standalone, um, non, not a mystery, you know, just more, uh, what is, I, I don't like these terms they use, but literary fiction, whatever that is, you know. All right, another question from Fasel. Uh, he's saying, how do you handle bad reviews? Uh, I, yeah, I usually cry. Um, no, I, I don't. I, uh, I'm actually, one thing that what helped me over the years is, as an academic, 
And uh, again, I know Pete could corroborate this. I don't know if there are other academics. Uh, you, you do have to get used to rejections uh, and criticism, academia thrives on argument. So uh, even in my department, you, you, you go and present a work in progress and they'll rip it apart, right? So um, uh, doesn't mean you like it, but you sort of get used to those rejections over the years. So um, uh, it, is, it is different when you're writing creative stuff, you sort of take it a little more personally, but it's not, I just look at it as an opportunity to try to be better maybe if you agree with the criticism, you know, to try to uh, attend to those problems in the next time around. Yeah, great, great. I'm sorry, uh, I'm not, we've gone over time, so. <laughs> no, that's all right. But we, I, I mean, that was very enjoyable and thank you so much for all those uh, in-depth time that you took to answer every question that we had planned here. And um, Akmiha, thank you so much for coming and joining and volunteering your time too.